uh, we're moving towards uh, a new series, and it's called Unchanging. And it's, uh, as I mentioned, it's because it's the beginning of the new year in the Christian c- calendar, uh, we're going into a new series. And Christmas is supposed to be about Jesus, right? Um, if I was to ask you, when does Jesus enter into the story of Scripture? What would you guys say? Like New Testament? Genesis 1, maybe? You might say, oh yeah, you know, God created the world, so Jesus was there, right? Uh, and w- so, I, you know, when did Jesus, when did you, when was the first time you see Jesus in the story of Scripture? And, you know, the easiest answer towards that is the New Testament, right? When Jesus was born, uh, you see Jesus coming into it. And, um, you know, one of the questions for family time was, a lot of people, you know, Christians and non-Christians alike, but especially non-Christians, when they see the Bible and when they see Scripture, they see uh, the God that the, the Old Testament kind of portrays and then the God that is, you, you see in the New Testament, uh, which is usually uh, seen as Jesus, that they're so different in their character, in their outworking, in the way that they, um, they act, right? And so it, they, they almost treat them as two different gods. But... For a lot of people, this difference was too great that there's a lot of heresies. Uh, one of the last, most lasting and persistent heresies is that uh, Jesus in the New Testament is God and the God of the Old Testament is this older, uh, archaic God that we can just throw away. Um, but the New Testament itself disproves it. It says, as Kevin was about to read, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus in the Old Testament is the same as Jesus is in the New Testament, which is the same as Jesus today, which is the same, same as Jesus who will come in glory and institute his kingdom on the final day. Actually, the New Testament states that Jesus was always existing. Uh, just in case you don't believe me, First uh, Colossians uh, 1, 15 to 16 says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him... All things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. So he was always there. Even before the the statement, in the beginning, God created, he was was with God. And John chapter 1 says that. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. And it's just a clear sign pointing to Jesus Christ as always being in existence. Uh, the, the term for that is the pre-existent Jesus. He existed before he was born, before the creation of the world. He was not created but always was. This is an ins- essential part of what we call the doctrine of the Trinity, right? Right? Uh, the Holy Trinity, which is a hallmark of what Christian, you know, Orthodox, which just means right belief, uh, or Orthodox Christian faith is. You'll see like a lot of different, this is, has nothing to do with my sermon um, or where I'm going to go with this, but you'll see that uh, there's a lot of different like Christ- people, groups of people that call themselves Christians out there, right? A lot of churches out there, right? And you can tell um, what, whether this is a church, let's say you're traveling and you're on vacation and you want to go to church on Sunday because you never miss a Sunday service. Uh, and then so you go to that church and you're like, is this a church that I can uh, worship God in? You go into the church, you look at their statement of beliefs and they say, no, Jesus was not, um, was not God or Jesus was the first Adam. Actually, he, Adam turned into Jesus or um, like some, I think Mormons believe that. Or we will all become Jesus in the future when we die. And then, uh, then people, there will be all this kind of uh, a wave of new Jesuses and, and new sons of God happening. And it's this line between if you believe in the Trinity, you're an okay Christian. And if you don't believe in the Trinity, that's when you become a cult or a heresy or, or, or some weird you know, Christian sect. Okay, So if you want to say, is this church okay? Look at if they believe in the Trinity or not. If they don't, don't go to that church. Or you can, but uh, you can preach the gospel there and you know, change them and convert them and bring the Holy Spirit power into there. But anyways, Jesus actually appears in the Old Testament. Um, and whenever he comes into the Old Testament, uh, there's these, it's, it's called a Christophany. 
Uh, it's an appearance of Christ. You know the word epiphany? When you're like sitting there and you're like, oh, I had this epiphany, right? What that means is like a, a, a revelation. I've had this wonderful revela- revelation, a, a divine revelation. So a Christophany is this revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, if you see God, a revelation of God, it's called a theophany, right? So uh, there's these things called Christophanies. And I just realized that in the craziness of today, um, I, di- I was going to show you a clip of, from the Bible Project because I have it written here. So I wrote it in the Bible Project, Angel of the Lord clip. I did not tell him. Uh, so uh, I encourage you guys to look up the Bible Project. It's a great resource. If you're reading the Bible and you're like, um, the Psalms, what does, what's the overall picture of the Psalms? You can go to the Bible Project. It has uh, video clips and very easy to understand and well-made um, kind of explanations of Bible, uh, introduction to the Bible and other biblical concepts as well. And one of those things is some call, uh, this term called the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. And actually comes up a lot in the Old Testament. I was kind of relying on the clip for it to explain it, so I have no notes here. But the angel of the Lord, um, there's, these rev- there's these encounters that people have with God in the Old Testament. And these angels of the Lord, this term angel of the Lord comes to them. But this angel is different from other angels because angel just means a messenger, the sent one, right? Uh, and uh, this, this word, the sent one, could be anything. And the, the distinctive of this angel of the Lord is that this angel of the Lord is not just bringing God's message, but he actually speaks as if he is God. If you read in the Old Testament, it, it, the, the, the line between what the angel of the Lord is saying and what God is saying is, is blurred. So often it starts with the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in the burning bush. And then God said, you know, take off your sandals for you are standing on holy ground, right? So there's this uh, blurring of it. And a lot of theologians, they see this angel of the Lord because you, no one can fully see God. What they, act, what they were actually seeing was Jesus Christ. It's a Christophany. It's a revelation of Jesus. And so uh, without the clip, I've explained it. It's better in the clip. Uh, Genesis 16 is this first in- instance of a Christophany where the angel of the Lord comes up. And today's passage picks up the story from the middle of the story, but the story actually starts in Genesis chapter 12, where God appears to Abraham, and he calls Abraham and says, I promise that you will be a great nation. And he blesses them. And all, there's so many like um, sermons based on this. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on this earth will be blessed through you. And Abraham is given this promise by God, but he has no children. And um, you know, God promises that he's going to be a great nation, but he needs children for that to happen. And so this promise to be a great nation is actually the promise of children, the promise of descendants, and of a line that will not die, right? And he promised to this, this, to this man who had no children of his home, is his own. And so this promise is repeated in Genesis chapter 15, where it says, uh, and Abraham said, you've given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. The word of the Lord came to him. The, this man, he's talking about the servant, uh, will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the stars and count the, uh, look up at the sky and count the stars, if you can indeed count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. So in Genesis chapter 15, he, God is re-emphasizing and uh, kind of reminding Abram of this promise that was given to him in Genesis chapter 12. But by the next chapter, Genesis chapter 16, the, uh, uh, today's passage, uh, the chapter of today's passage, already Sarah and Abraham have forgotten uh, God's promise. They've forgotten him. They are impatient. Uh, they don't know, really trust how God is going to help them make ch- uh, get children because they were so old at the time uh, when Abram finally gets uh, uh, his son Isaac. He's 100 years old. And so in their minds, in Sarah and Abram, that, you know, God promised us a child. How is this going to happen? I'm way past childbearing age. I've been barren my whole life. 
there must be some reinterpretation. Maybe we didn't really know uh, how God was going to do it. So maybe we'll have to kind of figure out what God really meant. And what they did was they, Sarah offers up her slave, Hagar. She was an Egyptian, right? Uh, they spent some time in Egypt. He probably got the slave as a gift from, uh, from the people of Egypt. Uh, and it was, it was a, she was a foreigner, a non-Israelite uh, from their time in Egypt. And this slave is given this task of bearing a child for her masters, right? So Hagar is, she's, in a, she's literally a sex slave, right? At this, at this moment, she's a sex slave and she's given to her master so that her master can impregnate her and have his child to bear his, the promise that God had given him. And so she does become pregnant, right? Uh, and, and that was probably not something that she desired, right? That's, she probably didn't grow up wanting uh, uh, a child by this foreign person who was her master rather than her own husband. And she wasn't really dreaming it. But it was her current situation and her circumstance. But for her also, because she was a slave, it was a hope for her, right? If, if she was to bear the only son of her master, Abram, then she, her, her station in life would rise. She would be favored among all the slaves. Uh, she would be the birth mother to the heir of all of Abraham's fortune, his wealth, and his promise, right? But that hope that Hagar had to rise up and to, to um, was it, increase in her station in life became twisted. It says in Genesis, right before today's passage, Genesis 16.5, it says, um, when she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her master. She began to despise or sorry, her mistress. So in her fertility, Hagar thought she was better than her mistress Sarai, who was barren. Because in that time, to be barren was a curse, right? So in her mind, her mistress was cursed. But if you think about it, she's a slave. It's not a blessing to be a slave. She herself is also cursed in society's eyes as well because a free woman was always better than a slave. And it shows this complexity of the human condition and how we're so easily, like we can try to assert our dominance over other. We compare ourselves and we can always be better than someone and look down upon someone and be condescending towards someone and think, oh, at least I'm not like him, or at least I'm not like her, or at least I'm not like those people there, right? We can always think that in a, no matter what we are ourselves, we can always be, have this cold heart towards uh, a fellow human being who's also suffering. So Hagar, as we see in today's passage, she does suffer, but she's not blameless in her suffering, Right? She's not totally without fault. But at the same time, she's not totally deserving of what had happened to her. She was mistreated by her mistress. She was mistreated by Sarah. So she ran away into the desert out of the security of her uh, household, of Abram's household, in order to alleviate her suffering. And uh, we read uh, verse 7, The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert, it was a spring that is beside the road to Shur. This foreign woman, this foreign slave runs away. Runs away uh, from the place that was uh, where her past torments her. Where her sexual history torments her. To a place that is isolated, that is away from everyone else. And rests beside a spring, a source of water. And this is where this angel of the Lord meets her, the first time in Scripture. And so look at, let's look at what the angel says to her. There, you see this command and a promise. In verse 9, 10, it says, The angel of the Lord told her, Go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The command is this, to go back. Go back to the place of suffering. Go back to the place of oppression. Go back to the people that were tormenting you and submit to them. And go back with this posture of humility and repentance. Because if you go back, this promise 
also, you, you go back with a promise. You know, not all places of oppression are, are, are blessed. You know, I'm, this is not a, a way, this is not a proof text for you guys to say, whenever you guys are suffering, you should always just take it and bear it. Right? If you're in an abusive relationship, just take it and bear it. If you're being oppressed, if you're a slave, just accept your social position, sit there and bear it because that's what God is wanting me to do. Look at the example of Hagar. That's not what it's saying because not all places of oppression are blessed. When Israel was in Egypt, God called them out of their place of oppression. God called them out of their place of suffering and their blessing was in the promised land, right? So you can't just take one example in the Bible and make it apply to every situation that you might be going through or that people might be going through. But when God says something to you, you follow it. If he says, go to the promised land, I'm going to call you and go to the promised land, you you obey that. That's where God's blessing is. And if God says, go back to the place of oppression, go back to the place of suffering, as we saw in the man with legion a couple weeks ago, then you also obey and you submit to the word of God. And Hagar was called back to her place under her mistress. But see that she didn't go back the same way that she left. She didn't go back with the same, uh, she didn't go back the same way that she ran away from that place. She went back with a posture of submission submission where there used to be this attitude of disobedience where there used to be hum- uh, where there used to be arrogance she went back with humility but this is the key here she went back with a promise of god where she used to be this backup plan of human conception and in this encounter god gives a name for her unborn son he calls her him ishmael a name that had all right to be given by his father. You know, when a son is born to a a household, the father has their first naming rights. But God shows himself to be the first father, right? The the true father of this child by naming him Ishmael, which means God hears. God hears. So every time she thinks of her son, Ishmael, he remembers that God hears her. God hears her cries for help. And every time she saw her son, every time she called out to him, Ishmael, Ishmael, she's remembering again that God hears me. Even though I'm a slave, even though I might be mistreated, God hears me and he hears my plight. And not only that, she gives God a name. This is the first time ever that that someone gives God a name. And it's this foreign slave, sex slave uh, girl that actually gives God a name. And he gives a name for Jesus. You see, Jesus here heard her suffering and he saw her suffering. And so she names him Elroy, God who sees me. The first name given to God by a human being was from Hagar. God sees this foreign woman. To the people of Israel, they thought themselves to be the chosen people, but the first person who gave their Jewish Israelite God a name was this Egyptian. God sees this, God sees Hagar, this evidence, who was the evidence of people not trusting in him. God sees this arrogant woman, and God loves her. Right? Contrary to all the reasons why he might not love her, why his people might say, God, you should not love this person, God loved her. Because no matter how many reasons there were against God loving her, there was one reason that he should. It's because he created her, and he knew her, he heard her, and he saw her. This isn't the end of the story. There's a sequel to this story. In Genesis chapter 21, we fast forward uh, later on, and now in between this time, next week we're going to get to it, right? Uh, Isaac was born to Sarah. You know, we're going to go back to that uh, next week. And we skip past this point, and we see this picture of these two boys. There's Ishmael, the older son, and Isaac, the younger but promised son, while they were growing up. 
And Isaac, who was finally weaned, you know, he, he was at the age where he could eat, uh, you know, normal food. And Ishmael was mocking, it says, in, in, in chapter 21. So Sarah starts to worry because there's this other son, right? The son of, from the other woman. And she gets protect over, protective over her son's inheritance and starts to demand that Hagar and Ishmael are sent away. So God sends Hagar... When he meets her pregnant, he sends her back to her mistress. And only a few years later, she's sent back into the wilderness by Hagar. She's sent away from that. You know, the, the, the thing that she was escaping, the thing that she was uh, running away from, and she goes back to with this posture of repentance and humility and submission. And you, you think that maybe circumstances would change because I have the promise of God, but still it's uh, the same sin and the same brokenness is being replayed. There's more oppression. There's more weakness. Again, Sarah, her master, becomes the source of suffering for her. Her situation is not a situation of promise and of blessing, but rather it's a situation of suffering again, even though that's where God called her to be. Right? Even though God calls you somewhere, there can be suffering amidst that. Suffering isn't the evidence that that's not where you're called to be. But God is still the same God who met her in the wilderness that time. God is still the one who sees, El Roy. And in Genesis chapter 21, verse 15 to 18, it says this. When the water in the skin was gone, because, you know, Abraham had sent her off with some water and food, she put the boy under one of the bushes, and she went off and sat down a bush out away. For she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. Like, can you imagine that? You're sent out into the wilderness and your son is going to die. Like, I see, this, the plight, I see this on Instagram all the time, the plight of mothers. When they're at their wits end with their children and they're just broken. It says, God heard the boy crying and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up, take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. See, God sees her sobbing. God hears the cry of this little boy. Just as the suffering was the same for Hagar in this sequel, God is also the same. And God's promise was also the same. God didn't forget his promise to her, even though she might have forgotten God's promise to her. God didn't forget the name that she gave to her, even though she might have forgotten what she used to call God. God was still the one who sees, the one who hears the cries of this mother and this child. God's character is unchanged. And we see that where this human source of water, the water that Abraham had given her, runs out, God gives her this divine source of water, a well of water revealed to her, in verse 19, it says, God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. That water, this divinely revealed water, saves her life. And it says, God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the de desert and became an archer. And I wonder that, you know, in, verse, uh, in, sorry, in chapter 16, God sends her back. And in Genesis chapter 21, he doesn't send her back, right? What's the difference? And I wonder if it's just a timing thing, right? I wonder if God allowed, uh, told her to go back because Ishmael needed to grow up a little. That there was, now that, that Ishmael was with her and he was able to hunt and he was able to provide for the two, that God was allowing her to be in this wilderness. You know, God's timing is so perfect, Genesis 16 wasn't the time for her to live apart from Abraham. Genesis 21, God provided everything that he needed, that they needed. And now we fast forward around 1,800 years, 42 generations according to Matthew. 
You know, just, you know, as we see, so many of the new movies that are coming out are not like new novel stories. They're like these reboots of old franchise, older franchises, or older intellectual property. We see another reboot here in um, for, 42 Generations Later. And 42 Generations Later, and that's actually from John chapter 4, Jesus again goes into a wilderness. It's not a physical wilderness, but it's a cultural and religious one, a wilderness called Samaria. It's a wilderness that was void of all Israelites, all people of God, a wilderness that had no religious tradition that was accepted by the Jewish people. He goes into Samaria where no Jew, no self-respecting Jew would choose to go. They would go all the way around Samaria rather than go through it, even though it's faster. And again, 1,800 years later, 42 generations later, Jesus meets this foreign woman, this Samaritan woman. And again, Jesus meets her by this source of water, which was now the well of Jacob. And again, this woman is running away. She's suffering and she's escaping from her situation. She's not physically running away, but she's chronologically running away. She's going to the well at a time where no one would go to the well, right? She was going to this time that where everyone who was tormenting her would not be. And she's suffering by the shame of her lifestyle, a lifestyle which, again, she was not totally deserving of, but also she wasn't totally blameless. She's not entirely at fault. And yet again, Jesus sees her and sees everything about her. In John chapter 4, verse 7 to 9, it says, When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? In verse 9, the Samaritan woman said, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? You see, Jesus crosses all these boundaries to speak with her in the wilderness, even though she is a woman, even though she was a Samaritan, even though she was a foreigner, even though she lived a lifestyle that was deemed sinful at the time. And after that con conversation with her, after that encounter that Jesus has with this woman, this is what happens to her in verse 28 to 29. She goes back, leaving her water jar. The woman went back to the town, just like Hagar went back. She went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? She goes back and is sent to bring her husband back, but she doesn't just bring her, her husband back because she has no husband. It's actually just a man she's living with. But she goes back to the place where five, four of her other husbands used to, or five of her other husbands used to, or her ex-husbands used to live. And she goes back to the place of oppression, the place where she's outcast, the place where she's mocked. And she goes back again, not the same way she, she left it. She leaves her water jar back, uh, at, at the well and she goes back with this promise. She goes back with the encounter of, of Jesus Christ. She goes back with the living water, even though she left her physical water jar there. And she goes back into that town, into her town, to redeem it, to bring the promise of salvation for many. The Hebrews 13.8 says again, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Jesus that Hagar met as she was running away from her suffering and her struggle, the Jesus that Hagar met when she was cast away from her home into the wilderness is the same Jesus that sees the Samaritan woman at the well. That's the same Jesus that sees you today. And I want to encourage you today that Jesus sees you. He sees what you're going through. He hears all of your unspoken prayers the things that are in your heart. He sees the things that you struggle with day in, day out, even though no one else might see it. And he says, the, the, the word of God says in Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. He sees you and he's close to you. I'll conclude with this. Praise be to God 
and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. When God comforts us, he also calls us to, save, to share that comfort with the people who need it. God sees you. God sees you in your situation. But he's also calling you to be his eyes, to see the people around you, to see what they're going through. And the same comfort that you received, the same blessing and the same word that you received, the same promise that you received, to share that with them. Because that's the reason why you were given that promise. Not just for yourself, not just for your own health and well-being, but for the health and the well-being and the wholeness of this world. Let's pray.